We're going to spend the whole session tonight answering questions. We've got several that have been turned in. We're kind of do one that was turned in, and then we'll maybe take one from the audience. So we'll have some microphones out there. So you be thinking, if you've got questions that you didn't get written down, that you'd like to ask, we'll have a chance for you to do that. We're certainly glad you're here tonight and hope you've been enjoying our study of the book of Revelation. Tonight, just like every night, we've been videoing the presentations, and so we're going to video the question and answer session. So if you're uh, going to speak for the mic, you might be on video, and, and someone else will get the benefit of hearing your question and the answers that come with those. Uh, so we're looking forward to having those videos to share with you in the future. All right, time for the first question. Well, we're glad to have all of you here tonight to share in this question and answer session, and we hope that, that uh, we'll uh, find this to be profitable. I do hope some of you will ask questions from the audience. I think that will be helpful uh, as we uh, engage in this dialogue. Uh, so we'll uh, start. The first question is always the hardest, so we'll start with one that was turned in, and then that'll, that'll uh, soften you up a little bit, and then you can uh, ask questions from, from where you are. First question. Where are we between the time we die and the resurrection at the end of time? Is Abraham's bosom literal? If we are there, are we assured of heaven? In Hades, is Hades, where the rich man was, a lesser form of the lake of fire? So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, what the Bible teaches us about uh, where we go after this life. There are a lot of things that we want to know about that. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, all the full details are not given. We're given some glimpses that I believe can be helpful to us. This question refers to the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. So let's go there first. Uh, this says that uh, the rich man died and he went into, into a place called torment and uh, the, the, the uh, other man, uh, the, the beggar, Lazarus, went into Abraham's bosom. There was a great gulf between the two so that one could not pass from one to the other. What are we to learn from this about the afterlife? Well, let's see if we can draw some conclusions from that. Number one, we learn there is an afterlife. When we die, we're not like the dog rover, who when he died, he died all over. When we die, there is a life after death. Number two, we learn that there are, there are two conditions. You know, we, we sort of get hung up on place when we're talking about the spirit realm. That's, that's really a problem for us. See, where is this gonna be? Somebody says, well, wait a minute. The Bible says that we're gonna go up into the air. If I'm over here, I go that way. And if I'm in China, I go that way. How in the world are we ever gonna get together? You know, we, we were kind of hung up on place when it comes to spirit realm. I think a better, a better way for us to think of that would be condition or status. There are two conditions. Now they're described as places in the Bible and so God sort of accommodates our sense of place that way, I think. But we would do well, I believe, to think of the afterlife in two conditions. The rich man was in one status, Lazarus was in another status, another condition. We know that the rich man, his status was not pleasant. Uh, he is in a place called Tartarus, which means torment, torment. And uh, the, the, uh, the other man, Lazarus, was in Abraham's bosom, a place of pleasant, pleasantness. And so their conditions are different. We know that, it's, that once you die, it's fixed. You can't pass from one to the other. That's said and done and fixed. You can't change your status after you die. That's fixed. Uh, so those are things we can know about that. Now let's throw in some other passages a little bit. We know in uh, Acts chapter 2 that after Jesus died, he went to a realm called Hades. What is Hades? Hades is the Greek word for unseen. Jesus went to the unseen. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, the spirit world, we can call the unseen world. That's okay. So he, he went to Hades. Hades is that word that the Bible uses to apply to all of those who die go to this spirit realm called the unseen. Good and bad, they go to a spirit realm called Hades. The, uh, 
the, the, uh, the Greek has two different words for that. They have one word for hell, Gehenna, and another word for Hades. Uh, which so they're, they're two different words in the King James Version they're all translated with the word hell and that's a little confusing in other translations they, they uh, correct that so that there is a there is a condition where we go a place of unseen where we go after we die and there are uh, there is a sense of pleasantness for those who have been followers of Christ and a sense of unpleasant, uh, unpleasantness for those who have not Jesus said in Luke 23 to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember that? Paradise, that's another name I think for the condition of pleasantness uh, after death, like Abraham's bosom. And so here is, uh, Jesus is gonna be in that pleasant state and so will the, uh, so will the uh, thief on the cross who confessed to him. So here are some glimpses we have of that. When we put all that together, along with 1 Corinthians 15, which talks about resurrection of the body, uh, we get a picture kind of like this, I think. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how what is planted is not what comes up, it's like the seed. Does the seed, we talk about the seed coming up, does the seed really come up? The seed doesn't come up, does it? What you plant is the seed, what comes up is what grows out of the seed. And Paul uses that as an illustration. He says, we plant the body, and what comes up is not the body, the old body, that doesn't come up, but what comes up is a new body, incorruptible, immortal, when it comes up. So we might put it all together like this to kind of give a, a short answer to this question. When we die, our bodies go back to dust, but our souls, which is the part of us that exists eternally in the image of God. Our souls go to a place uh, called Hades, the unseen. And there they dwell in pleasantness or unpleasantness, depending on how we've lived, until the time of the resurrection. When the resurrection comes, our bodies are raised anew, a new body, and that soul can then re-inhabit that resurrected body. And then comes the time of judgment, when uh, there will be the eternal separation of the righteous and wicked into what we call heaven and hell. Now the question always is raised about that. If you're separated when you die into good and bad, then why have a judgment day later on? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? I wish I had a good answer for that. About the best I can do is to say, well, the soul is going to continue to exist. It wouldn't be right for the soul to go into a neutral zone. It's gonna go into a place of pleasantness or unpleasantness. And maybe we can think of it like this, that the, the separation takes place after we die because we are, uh, we, our souls are gonna exist somewhere. And the judgment day may be like the sentencing day. Our, our, we're already, we're already known as guilty or not guilty, but the sentencing comes with the final judgment. Maybe that would be a way of putting it into terminology that we can, uh, we can relate to. So that's sort of the best I can do about uh, what happens to us after we die. Connecting that with the book of Revelation for a minute, we have in chapter 20 of Revelation, the story of, the, uh, of those martyrs of the Roman persecution who wouldn't worship the beast, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This does mean that they were in their resurrected bodies. It says in verse four that they are souls, souls of the martyrs. They're still in their unresurrected state. That's called the first resurrection because there is a revival, kind of a revival of them uh, after their death because they've been revived, their cause continues and things are going well for them and so it's called a type of resurrection but not the bodily resurrection. That doesn't take place until we get over into chapter 20 verse 11 and 12 where uh, the sea gave up the dead when it and death and Hades gave up the dead when it so all the dead coming from wherever you might imagine the dead are stand before the throne of God. That's the resurrection of the body. So we've got the first resurrection is this, is this uh, reign that they have with Christ, this wonderful celebration that's sort of like a resurrection in a sense. Their cause remains, they, have a, they, they, are, 
they come out of martyrdom into something wonderful and so it's called a resurrection in, in a kind of a spiritual way but uh, the, they are they are part of they would be part of those souls in Hades and uh, they are described here in, and they in a particularly joyful state because uh, they are celebrating the, the defeat of their uh, their tormentor their persecutor the Roman Empire so maybe that will give us uh, a little bit of help in uh, the question about uh, what is uh, life uh, uh, like after we die. We don't know the answer to all those questions. What do we know the answer to? Which way you want to go? See, we know that, don't we? We don't know all the answers to what life is going to be like after we die or in heaven. But we know there's a good place and a bad place, and we know how to get one or the other. So that's what we want to keep in mind. We may not have all the answers to our curiosity about this, but let's be sure we don't forget to, to, to be in line to go in the right direction. That's the most important thing for us. Okay, somebody have a question. Would you raise your hand if you have a question? Here we are right back here, David. So we're going to, to get this question, and we'll uh, fill that in, and then we'll go back to some of the written ones, okay? I'm curious about the <clears throat> mark of the beast and not being able to buy or sell and the number 666. Okay. <laughs> well, he got a lot into that question, didn't he? Uh, the mark of the beast, not able to buy or sell, and 666. That's the end of chapter 13 of Revelation. So let's talk about that a little bit. In the book of Revelation, there are, there are it, it's a storyline. Remember, we talked about it being a story. A story told on one level, a, a spirit, a, a figurative level, and then the meaning is down here. So we have in, uh, in the book of Revelation a, a drama that unfolds. Now when you have a drama, what do you have to have? You have to have people on both sides, don't you? You have to have a fight, you have to have a chase, you have to have something that gives drama to it, okay? So there are two, there are two sides two sides in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7, we read about God putting a mark, which is later called his name, on the foreheads of those who are on his side. God marks those who are his, the 144,000. He's going to put a mark on them. They belong to him. And so the mark of God, the name of God, is written on the foreheads. Figuratively speaking, God puts his mark on those who are his people. And uh, they're his, and he wants them to know. I know you, I know you individually as much as if I'd written my name across your forehead. And so those 144,000 that represent the church of God, all of the church, we talked about that, they are, they have a mark. Now those who are on the other side have a different mark. Any of you watch Westerns? The good guys wear the, and the bad guys wear the, Okay, so in the Revelation, what have we got? We've got the good guys wearing the mark of God on their foreheads and the bad guys wearing the mark of the beast. Okay, you see? So that, that's what that is about, the mark of the beast. Now, back to chapter 13, how do you get the mark of the beast? How do you get to be in his camp? Well, the second beast that came up out of the land is going to put up images. He's going to put up statues of the of the heads of the Roman emperors and those who worship him would of course qualify for what getting his mark see they'll get the mark because they've qualified for it by worshiping the beast we're told that indeed there were even sometimes tokens issued to those who had worshiped the beast as proof that they had done that worship and what did those tokens do well, we're told that they allowed them to engage in economic transactions, to buy and sell, okay? So those with the mark of the beast were given privileges, while those that refused to worship the beast had privileges taken away from them. And so in that section it talks about they were not able to buy or sell, uh, and uh, they were able to buy and sell, and, and, and people who didn't worship the beast would be killed and things like that. And so you have here the consequences of which side you're on. If you have the mark of the beast, you're on the side of the beast. And so you get the privileges that go with that. 
On the other hand, you also get the trouble that goes with that later on, don't you? On the other hand, here is the mark of God on your forehead, and uh, there you may be subject to death and economic distress and all kinds of troubles, but you have the good things ahead of you out there, because if you are faithful into death, then you will uh, get the crown of life. And so you have good things coming on in store for you if you will be faithful to him. So it's a kind of a way of, of talking about the people on the two sides of this issue, those who worship the beast and those who don't. Now 666. Okay. In the Bible, several times in different places, we have things that are mentioned which come out of a context that the people of that day knew that we don't know. In 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says to the Thessalonians, like I said when I was with you, well, we don't know what he said when he was with them, you see. So they knew something we don't know. I think in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, what is it, verse 33, about baptism for the dead. The Corinthians knew something about that we don't know, so it's hard for us to know what that meant because we don't know what they knew. So when it comes to the mark of the beast, I believe we have something similar. Um, I mean, the 666, we have something similar. That, that expression starts, that verse starts, let him that reads understand. He, he says there's something here for you to understand. There's a clue in this 666 number if you know what it means. There's a clue in here for you if you'll use it right. But we don't know what they knew, so it's not a clue for us. See, that makes it harder, doesn't it? Because we don't know what they knew about 666. Now we can guess. My best guess says it means Ronald Reagan. <laughs> You're, you're laughing. Wait, wait, wait. What's his name? R-O-N-A-L-D-6, W-I-L-S-O-N-6, R-E-A-G-A-N-6, Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. <laughs> you look doubtful. <laughs> well, let's try another one. It's a, it's a big computer in Belgium that has the number 666 on it. It's the barcode of the grocery store. That would have meant a lot to those people that first received the book, wouldn't it? Well, all those are suggestions that have been given. What does it mean? Well, let me suggest two possibilities for you, two possibilities. The number seven is a number that we think, that, that's used a lot in Revelation, and we think of that as the, and they thought of it then as the number that means completeness, fullness, totality. And so seven was a number for success. Where does the number six fall in relation to the number seven? Falls short of it, doesn't it? So if seven, seven, seven means success, 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 six, six, six means failure, failure, failure. So that's one, that's one interpretation of this is it means failure, failure, failure. That's the number of the beast because he's going to fail. Failure, failure, failure. Another suggestion is that, that uh, in those days they did more with, uh, with numbers having, uh, with letters having a numerical equivalent. We, we have some of that, don't we? What, is, what does five stand for? V, what does V stand for? I mean five. X stands for 10. M stands for thousand, okay? So there were, we, we still have some of those Roman numerals and we remember what number they stand for. Well, in those days, they did more of that. And uh, there's a letter, for example, from a, uh, from a uh, boy who says, my girlfriend's number is 327. What's he done? He's taken the letters of her name and added them up, and they added up to 327. So that was a kind of a th game they played. That was the thing they did. Well, maybe it's like that. And 666 is the totality of the of the number equivalent of the letters in somebody's name. Now those who have studied this say, well, there is a way in which Emperor Nero's name comes out to 666. If you spell it like the Jewish Jews would have written it, the Jewish people would have written it, 
then it comes out 666. And so it says there is the number of a man. That would be Nero. He is one of the Roman emperors. What is Nero famous for in terms of the book of Revelation? He is the first Roman emperor to persecute the Christians. See? Well, that kind of ties in pretty good, doesn't it? And if you notice in, uh, in the uh, 13th chapter, back up earlier, it says that the beast, one of the heads of the beast looks like it has been, has been slain and has come back to life. Well, that we can connect with Nero because Nero was killed under kind of strange circumstances, maybe committing suicide, and they never did know for sure that he was dead. And there's always this, this, uh, this uh, rumor going around that Nero was going to come back to life. They even called it the Nero Redivivus myth, the Nero come back to life myth. Anybody here remember World War II? Three of you remember World War II. Good, okay. Um, what happened to Hitler? Remember? Did he really die in that bunker? I don't know. I think he's in South America, and I think he's coming back. You remember that? Remember that talk? Did not really dead? The Hitler come back to life myth, you see? Okay. So there was this Nero come back to life myth. And that may be what's played on here, that Nero is coming back to life in the sense that he died, but he was a, perse he was a persecuting emperor. And if there comes back later another persecuting emperor, what is it like? Nero come back to life, you see. And so when you get down to chapter 17 in Revelation, you've got this thing where... Uh, it says there's, there's seven heads, five are past, one is, one's yet to come, and then there's an eighth, which is really one of the seven. He, like one of the seven come back to life. So we have uh, this sort of uh, connection that we might make, can't be sure about it, wouldn't want to stake my life on it, but there is a possibility that there's a reference here to this Nero come back to life thing that would have been in the culture of their day. And there's a possibility that 666 is a connection with Nero as the letters of his name might have spelled, uh, might have added up when you translated them in numbers, might have spelled 666. I don't think we will ever know for sure what 666 means because they knew something we don't know. It was a clue for them and it's not a clue for us. But that's about the best explanation I can give for it. Okay, let's see. Let's take another question from those turned in. And then we will, uh, then we will uh, uh, go back to questions from the audience. Why must Satan be released for a while in chapter 20, verse 3? Why must Satan be released for a little while? Okay, Satan is bound for a thousand years. Somebody else has a question about where is Satan now? Where is he now? Is he in the abyss now? The abyss in Revelation is the headquarters of evil. It's where Satan is chained and locked in the abyss. It's also where uh, we have uh, uh, locusts coming from, and they are coming from the source of evil, and uh, the destroyer comes out of the abyss, and he, uh, he leads these locusts, and they hurt evil people, and so we have all of this. Uh, that was, uh, that's with the, uh, 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 the fifth, uh, the, the fifth the seal. So the abyss is the headquarters of evil. And that's where Satan is, is bound and, and retained in the, in the, in the abyss. Uh, King James Version, the bottomless pit. Now, what does that mean? Well, it says he is bound so he can deceive the nations no more until the thousand years is over. God has allowed him previously in the book to deceive a worldwide coalition of nations, the Roman Empire, into trying to persecute the church out of existence. And I believe this is a promise that God will not let him do that again. God will not let him again try to persecute the church out of existence by using a worldwide empire. Satan is going to be bound in that sense. Doesn't mean he's bound in every sense. Doesn't mean he is literally in an abyss somewhere. See, we're back to this 
place for spiritual things, aren't we? See, you, you, we, get, we don't get hung up on a place for a spirit being. That's a, a physical location for a spirit being. That's, that'll get us in trouble if we push that too far. So Satan is, the, the figure is Satan is bound in the sense that he cannot deceive the nations anymore. That's the sense in which he is bound. Doesn't mean he can't, he can't tempt individuals. Doesn't mean he can't do some things around. He can do that, but he cannot do what God just laid him do earlier in the book, that is, use a worldwide coalition of nations to try to stamp out the church. He can't do that anymore. Now, um, why does he have to be released for a little while? I don't know. He doesn't say why he must be released for a little while, but uh, that's what it says. The best I can put that together would be this, that God has, in the storyline, God has bound him in the abyss, but is that where he wants him forever? Where does God want him in the long term? Wants him in the lake of fire, doesn't it? See, in the lake of fire. Well, how do you get him out of the abyss and into the lake of fire? Well, you have to turn him loose from one place so you can get him into the other place, okay? So that's what it says. He'll be released. He'll be released. And as soon as he's released, what does he start to do? He says, I'm going to gather my forces and surround the camp of the saints. I'm going to start to do what God kept me from doing for this whole long period called the thousand years. I'm going to do it. Now I'm released. I'm going to do it now. And as he begins to surround the camp of the saints, God strikes him with the fire from heaven and says, you're going into the lake of fire. So it doesn't seem as if he ever does any damage. He does, it's nothing said that he hurts the church. He just wants to. Which says Satan has not changed in this thousand years. He didn't change a bit. He still wants to do the damage he once got to do. He's going to try it again. God says, not this time. And sends him into the lake of fire. So he's been transferred from one prison to the other. In the process of transfer, he showed he hasn't changed his colors. He still wants to hurt Christians, just like he always did. But God says, no, not this time, and sends him into the lake of fire. So uh, that's about all I can say about why that is a part of the storyline of the book of Revelation, is that it allows God to move him from where he is said to be bound uh, in the abyss so that he can put him in his permanent place, the lake of fire. Okay, let's see if we have another question from the audience now. Okay, right over here we have a question. Can we get a mic uh, down here, please? And uh, Tom will let you ask the next question. <clears throat> right here. Raise your hand again, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I'd uh, like a follow-up, too. Uh, the first question, this storyline applied very well to those of the first century who were being persecuted by Rome. Do you think there is also a broader application that says that any evil power that tries to destroy the church, God will bring them down as well as he did Rome. Okay. Can we feel that assurance? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, the book of Revelation says to those people of the first century, uh, there's going to come a terrible persecution on you. It's going to be very difficult for you. If you'll be faithful, I'm going to take care of you. I'll give you a wonderful place to go. And church, if you'll be faithful, the church will survive your cause will continue, and I will bring down to defeat the Roman Empire. Now, the question is, can we have that same assurance today? And I believe the answer is yes. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. I believe nations that become bent on doing evil and harming people and not fulfilling their God-given mission as a nation, God will bring down to defeat. I mean, you can look all through history. Uh, there were many of us when the communism seemed to be growing and, uh, and prospering who were saying it won't last forever. God will not let a, a, a corrupt system that denies the existence of God and takes people's rights away from them, God won't let that go on forever. I don't believe he will. And so the time came, we got to see it. We got to see that the time came when God brought that evil empire, since we're talking Reagan tonight, uh, that evil empire down to defeat because it had within itself the seeds of its own defeat. And I believe any, any power 
that, uh, that attacks God's people and God's purposes and God's plan is going to be doomed for defeat. Now, it doesn't mean it'll happen immediately. It may take a couple hundred years like it did in the book of Revelation. It may take a while. It may take longer than our lifetimes. But it's always been true. I mean, historians have documented this carefully, that nations that become immoral enough, evil enough, uh, greedy enough, they don't stand very long. And so I believe it will be with any nation that turns its back on God and, and does not fulfill the purpose for serving its people like God intends governments to do. So yes, I believe that, that there are many lessons, uh, and, and to extend on that a little bit, there are many lessons in Revelation that were given to those people in that time and circumstance first. But there's certainly many applications of that that we can learn today. I mean, in, 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 this, in this drama, God won and Satan lost. What's going to happen in the drama of our day? God's going to win, Satan's going to lose. In our lives, if we'll let him, God will give us the victory. And those who follow Satan are going to be defeated. So uh, there are many, many lessons in the book of Revelation that I think are equally applicable to our age, even though they're not, our age is not specifically mentioned in the book, as I understand the book. Okay, let's take another question from our uh, turned-in ones here. Uh, when the Lord comes again, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so will they ever be with the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, 17. Do you think Jesus will touch the earth then, or return to heaven? We have no indication in Scripture that Jesus is ever going to touch, the, touch foot on the uh, earth again. There's nothing that says he will come back to earth, actually to, the, uh, to touch the earth. He's going to come and take us up with him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know that we can say for sure he will not, but there's no indication that he will. And I think that ties with our discussion about thousand year reign on earth. Uh, there's no indication in that passage, uh, Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6, that Christ is going to reign on, and that doesn't say on the earth, that's a reign that was a, a spiritual celebration of the martyrs with Christ. And so, as we just said when we discussed that, it's not an, not an earthly reign. And so, as far as I know, there's no passage that specifically says Jesus is going to set foot on earth again. Acts chapter 1, he's going to come back as we saw him leaving. Uh, but he comes back only to, to, take, uh, to, to bring an end to things, to raise the dead, and then uh, after judgment to take us home with him. Okay, let's uh, take another question from the audience. If we have a... Okay, right here. We have... Uh, can we bring the mic down here? We have a question down here. Uh, right in here, David. Lady in the white shirt. I uh, wanted a little bit more explanation on your... Uh, the woman and the dragon. Okay. Um, and how you defined that again. Okay, the woman and the dragon. In uh, chapter 12... Um, Chapter 12 begins by saying that uh, there was a woman who appeared. She appeared standing on the moon. The sun was wrapped around her shoulders. She has 12 stars around her head. And uh, she is uh, uh, about to bear a child. Meanwhile, standing by is a great red dragon. Well, we know in verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9, who the dragon is. We studied that. The dragon is... Satan, the dragon is Satan. So Satan is standing by to devour the child as soon as it's born. Now who is the child? Well, the child is said to be the one who shall rule the nations with a rod of iron, so there's not much doubt about that, is it? The child is Christ, the Satan is dragon, uh, who is the woman? Well, <clears throat> what do we know about the woman? We know, number one, that she is said to give birth to Jesus. Number two, we know that she may be represented as some great glorious figure standing upon the moon with the sun around her shoulders and stars around her head. We know from later in the chapter that Satan wants to destroy her. He chases her. And we know from the last verse of chapter 12 that Christians, those who, who hold the testimony of Jesus, are also her offspring, her children. So the church is her offspring. She is the mother of Christ. Satan wants to stop her. Uh, these are things that we know. What would fit that? 
Well, we run several possibilities by. We say, okay, Mary gave birth to Jesus. That fits. Would you call Mary the mother of, the, of all Christians? Well, that would not work, would it? And I don't know of any time Mary got wings and flew off into the wilderness, as this woman is said too. So, and hardly would you think of a real literal woman standing on the moon with the sun around her shoulders. So it doesn't seem to be Mary. Maybe it's the Jewish nation. Did the Jewish nation give birth to Jesus? Well, yeah, that would be okay. Did Jesus preserve the Jewish nation by giving them wings so they could fly away and be protected? What happened to the Jewish nation in 70 AD? Destroyed, city destroyed, Jews scattered. So that doesn't seem to fit, and you would hardly say the Jewish nation is the mother of the church when as a whole they turn Jesus down, so that doesn't fit. Uh, well, some have said, well, that glorious woman is the church. Well, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is pictured as a woman. Okay. Did the church give birth to Jesus? Well, that won't work. And Christians are the offspring, so you wouldn't say the church is the, is the offspring of the church. That wouldn't work very well. Well, we're kind of running out of options, aren't we? What's, what's another option? I think the best option is that the, the woman represents the plan of God. The glorious plan of God. You remember Romans 8, 28? All those are accorded, called according to his purpose. The great purpose of God. The great plan of God. Now, Ephesians 3 talks about how it has gradually unfolded. The mystery has gradually been unfolded. And now it's made known through the church. The manifold wisdom of God. So God has had this plan. Started way back before the world began. For saving people if they were lost. That plan certainly is a glorious plan and may be represented as this wonderful woman. That's what Satan attacked. The plan, the plan may be said to have given birth to Jesus because Jesus' birth was the fruition of that plan. And that plan may be said to have given birth to Christians because we are the children of that plan of God. So to me, the most, uh, the most likely uh, possibility is that the woman represents the plan of God that Satan was trying to keep from getting, uh, getting established. He wanted to keep that plan from, uh, from operating. And God says, no, you can't do that. You can persecute the offspring of the plan, but you can't kill the plan. So that's what I understand the, uh, the plan, uh, the, the woman to be. Okay, let's take another one from our original questions here. Now, we're not probably going to get to all of these tonight, but we'll do all we can. Is the 15, 1,500 miles square the literal dimension of heaven, of the new heaven, or is that just the new Jerusalem? Are the walls about that high, 210 feet, I said, and what reason do you think they are? And if we live within the walls, what are the 12 gates for? Okay, well, that's a, that's a good question for us, and it takes us to chapters 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem. Well, everybody with me? Repeat it. Let's do it one more time, okay? This may be the last time we get to do it. This is what it says. Say it with me. This is what it says. This is what it means. Okay. Well, it says that it's a perfect cube, 1,500 miles on, uh, on the side. It says that it is... Uh, has streets of gold. It says that it has a great high wall, 210 feet around it, uh, high around it. It has three gates on each of the four sides. The gates are always open. The gates are one huge pearl and so on. But we must understand that we're in a figurative book and this is a figurative description. Uh, we must not take this literally uh, any more than we take the, uh, the description of hell as a sea of melted sulfur to be literal. What is God trying to picture for us? Living, trying to exist in a lake of melted sulfur is about as horrible an experience as I... Did you ever, did you ever get in the chemistry lab and drop a little drop, drop of sulfur on you? Boy, it'll absolutely eat your skin alive. And you think of living in a, in a sea of melted sulfur, and that's, that's about as horrible a thing as you can imagine. God is trying to picture the worst thing he can on one side and the best thing he can on the other side. See, that's, that's the contrast. So we must not get caught up in the literal details of that description. That's a figurative description. 
uh, that makes us think it's a wonderful place. And we talked about how heaven is perfect, how it is a place of perfect fellowship. All the good people will be there. It's a place of perfect provisions. Eat of the tree of life and drink of the crystal river that flows from the throne of God and walk on streets of gold, a place of perfect provisions. It's a place of perfect protection because it's a cube and has high walls around it. It's a place of perfect protection. Nothing will ever get you there. And it's a place of perfect joy. No tears, no sorrow, no death, no separation, no disappointment. Place of perfect joy. So God is picturing, through this picture he gives us, a place of perfection. As opposed to a place that's worse than anything you can imagine. So we want to be sure we don't get hung up on the uh, on the uh, literal details of that description because uh, like so many other things in the book of Revelation they're figurative and we want to understand them in that sense but we d see don't be sure you don't misunderstand this okay when I say he this is what he says and this is what he means I don't mean that that he says something that's not true and I don't mean he says something that's not real he just uses the figure to bring out the greater meaning you see that's what he does and so we must understand it in that sense. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's um, uh, see who else has a question. Somebody else have a question? Raise your hand over here. Somebody back here. Okay, I uh, saw this one over here first. Yeah, right, uh, right over there. Good. Okay, let's have your question. I had a question about uh, Revelation chapter six uh, and the four horsemen. Uh, the first one, uh, I believe, was on the white horse. I have heard people say that this is Christ. I had some people say this is the Antichrist. What's your opinion on that? <laughs> uh, neither. Anybody have another question? Okay, let's let's go back to the to the white horseman, uh, r rider on the white horse. Uh, Jesus, uh, the uh, this, the the um, uh, is pictured there as a lamb. He opens the first seal and the rides across the stage a white horse. Now. If we had time to talk about all the horsemen, you'll remember it says in every case, in every case it says that it was given to the horsemen. Something is given to the horsemen. Uh, the first, the rider on the white horse, it's given to him uh, to, to take peace from the earth. To the second horseman, the red horseman, he's given a great sword to go forth and conquer. Uh, the third horseman is given a balance so that he can measure grain for a high price. And the fourth horse uh, is pale, and, and death rides that horse, and it's given him to kill by other means. It's given. Who does the giving? Well, whose place are they in? What do we just see described in chapter 4? The throne room of God. And who calls these horsemen? An elder calls them to come out. And so these are servants of God. These are not anti to God. These are servants of God. These are agents of God. These horsemen are God's agents. Now, so that eliminates Antichrist. And, and, and you know, we're, we're, going to, we're going to, the second half of this series, we're going to talk about uh, Antichrist and rapture and a lot of those things. So we'll get into that in much greater detail in some of our later lessons. But, uh, so I believe the white horseman is not, certainly not Antichrist. Is it Jesus himself? Well, later on in chapter 19, Jesus rides a white horse. So here's a white horse there and a white horse in, the, in chapter 6. So is Jesus the same one? They're described differently. They wear different kinds of crowns. They have different, uh, they, they, they described in different ways. And so I would say that is an indication that it is not Jesus. Also, if you make the first one Jesus, and the next three, which seem to be parallel, um, you, you, ru you ruin the parallelism if you make one of them to be Jesus and the other three to be something else. So I believe the best answer to that is that all four horsemen are God's agents to affect the affairs of men. He affects their world. He, God is sitting in the center of the universe. God is in charge. He sends out his horsemen to, to affect the affairs of the world. Paul said in Romans chapter, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 17, speaking to on Mars Hill, that the God, the unknown God of these Greeks that they talked about, that he's telling them about, 
sets the boundaries of people's countries, the boundaries of their habitations. God is active in the affairs of men. And so God is active in the affairs of men. As we said a while ago, God brings nations up and he brings nations down. In the Old Testament, God says, I'm going to bring up a nation to, to spank my nation Israel. I, God was active in the affairs of nations in the Old Testament. No reason to believe he is not still active in the affairs. I believe these horsemen represents God's activity in the affairs of men. He can conquer, he can bring to defeat, uh, he can bring peace, he can bring uh, difficulties, economic hardships. God is active in the affairs of nations. And through that means, he makes nations rise and fall. What's also interesting is that as soon as God has run these horsemen across his stage and given them power, the very next seal is opened and the, the martyrs ask the question, how long, O Master, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that are on the earth? As if to say, God, if you got all the power you just prayed it across here, why don't you use it and bring down the persecutor? And eventually God does, doesn't he? Because he brings down the Roman Empire, chapter 16. And so uh, I believe these are, these are horsemen that represent the power of God uh, to, ha to be active in the affairs of men. And, uh, and, and none of them, I believe, represents either the Antichrist or Jesus himself. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, here we've got uh, uh, another question or two, and then we'll see if we have one more time for one more from the audience.